Welcome everyone, this is um, our Veneto tasting, uh, the theme that goes live uh, pretty soon at the end of this month. Um, as always we're going to taste 12 different wines today, uh, just bear, bear in mind that the sort of average ABV is probably about 12% so if you do try it later on uh, please use the spittoons, uh, otherwise enjoy yourselves. Um, right, um, when it comes to Veneto, um, it's, uh, it's quite a popular region, uh, especially in the UK. There's quite a lot of wines uh, from Veneto in the UK and, and Europe, as a matter of fact. Um, can you name a couple of wines from Veneto? Anyone? Prosecco. Yay! Yay! Wow. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. So, so we have Prosecco, we have the Amarone, Valpolicella and Suave, this uh, sort of main, you know, main. Is Amarone from there? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's the sort of flagship of Veneto, if you like. Um, so, we've got in our box from Veneto, uh, none of these. So, remember, the Y52 is actually a discovery cup. So, we always try to find the sort of hidden gems within the region and uh, we want to go off the beaten track, if that makes sense. Looking at the map, we are in the sort of north uh, east part of Italy, um, very much in between the Friuli and um, Trentino to, to the west. Uh, if you look up over the Alps, there's Austria, and to the south we have Emilia Romagna. So, very briefly, we are going to talk about the region, but just sort of touch on it, and the same goes for the wineries. So, if you're looking for any more information, please refer it to our magazine GLAC. Uh, you're going to find plenty of um, useful uh, information over there about the wineries in the region itself. Um, but we are quite limited on time, so we're going to focus predominantly on the wines. Um, when it comes to Veneto, they sort of are a transition region between the Germanic north, so you know Austria and Slovenia and the rest of it to the north, and the sort of more um, Roman influence south if you like. Um, and that applies to the culture and the food and the wines as well. Um, very briefly speaking about the region and the geography and the sort of climate of Veneto, there are a couple of things that influence and moderate the climate. Uh, the big and the obvious wine uh, is to the north, that's the Alps. So they sort of stop all the cold weather from, from the north and they elevate the vineyards as well. Uh, then we have the Lake Garda to the, to the west. This is actually the biggest um, lake in Italy. Um, then we have the Adriatic Sea as well and a couple of different rivers going through through the region itself. So generally speaking, the climate of Veneto is continental. However, we have all these different things uh, moderating the climate and creating different uh, mesoclimates and hundreds if not thousands uh, microclimates. Uh, as a result, in Veneto you can find, I believe it's 15 DOCGs, about 29 DOCs. So DOCGs and DOCs, they protected designated areas within, within the region, uh, recognized for high quality. Uh, and I think there are about 10 different IGTs, which is a sort of lower, um, lower um, classification, if you like. Um, but briefly speaking, we can divide Veneto in three different sub-regions uh, when it comes to climate. So to the west, I'll just point it up on, on the map so it's easier. Um, so we have this sort of west-north in here. Um, that's that's around the, so very close to uh, to the Lake Garda and south um, from the Alps. Then we have the centre, so that's the area right in, in here, just sort of very close to Vicenza. And we have the north, um, sorry, the northeast, close to the river Pade. Um, and let's talk about each and every one of them very, very briefly. So starting from the northwest, um, this is where we have the Lake Garda, this sort of very dramatic landscape of the Alps in the background. Um, it's quite a cool region, there's loads of this sort of, sort of cool air coming down from the Alps. However, Lake Garda acts as, as this sort of um, a storage of heat, if you like, so it sort of moderates that cool climate, uh, allowing for viticulture. So overall, it's, it's actually quite moderate. Um, however, the wines from there, they, they're fresh, they're crisp, they're light, they have a lovely acidity and freshness to them. 
Uh, this is the home of the sort of indigenous um, grape varieties from Veneto. So we have the Corvina, Corvignone, Rondinella uh, for the reds, uh, then the Garganega for, for the whites, as well as all sorts of different types of Trebbiano, including the Trebbiano di Suave, which is actually Verdique from the south. But um, it's Italy, so it, it gets quite complicated when it comes to that. Um, so, yeah, generally speaking, a cooler climate, high elevation, so you have the vineyards planted on, on steep slopes, and the wines are very crisp and fresh and relatively light, actually. Uh, then we move to the centre. So this is the sort of this is the area around the Vicenza. It's a little bit flatter. It's a little bit warmer, and this is where they plant more of the sort of in, 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 sorry international grape varieties. So think of your Cabernet Sauvignon, your Merlot, your um, Cabernet Franc, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. All these sort of things they try a little bit better over there because it's just warmer. Uh, and the wines tend to be a little bit softer, a little bit rounder, with more alcohol, more body, and the sort of riper fruit flavour, if you like. The, the last one, we're looking at the northeast Veneto, as I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. Uh, and this is the Prosecco lands, okay? This is where you find places like Cartizza, uh, which you can see on this uh, beautiful picture to, to the left. Um, so the sort of lovely rolling hills uh, full of glera planted everywhere. Uh, it rains, um, the rainfall is moderate but it's consistent and it's quite warm as well. So this sort of creates like close to perfect um, growing conditions for you know, all sorts of type, type of grape varieties. Uh, but glera in particular found its, its sort of home, homeland over there. Um, glera, it's your grape variety used for Prosecco. Right, the wines, okay, finally, right? Um, right, so, the first two white wines uh, are both from Cas um, Cantina del Castelnuovo del Garda. Uh, again, for any more information about the wineries, please uh, refer to our magazine. Um, but let's have a little um, sniff of that wine whilst we're talking about it. So, um, Custozza, this is the region, it's actually a DOC, so this is a protected, designated area of origin. Um, and any wine of DOC, um, you know, status, if you like, they, they, have to, uh, they have to meet certain criteria. So these are wines of higher quality and they, they've been recognised um, as such. Um, Custozza is always a blend, uh, mainly it's, uh, it's a Garganega and Trebbiano. So Garganega is a great variety responsible for your suave. Um, and um, over there we're looking at a sort of moderate, cool climate, okay? Um, but Garganega is the, is the key in here, so that's the great variety that's um, prized by wineries and winemakers as well as, as um, by the consumers. So it produces wines that are relatively rich, they're quite perfumed, they're quite aromatic, um, and it's quite a collective grape variety, so it produces quite a lot of grapes as well. So kind of everybody wins, if you like. Uh, and then they added some Trebbiano and some Cortese and some Thai, which is also known as um, fruit. Um, Juliano. Um, when we smell this wine, it's got this lovely sort of um, definitely ripe aroma, so you definitely get this sort of almost like a candy, like a red candy, candy fruit to it. Uh, there's stone fruit, you have citrus, um, just a little bit of herbs perhaps, maybe that sort of um, slightly baked apple, that's mm -hmm. quite, um, quite typical for, for the Garganega grape. Uh, Overall, quite an aromatic, quite a, a, a pretty nose, if you like, and quite a ripe as well, considering the climate. <clears throat> In the palate, initially you get this sort of lovely weight from the Garganega, so, so it starts quite, you know, quite soft and rubbed, but finishes with this lovely sort of citrusy acidity and this sort of herbal lift, which is, I think, is quite delicious. Um, also, I don't know if you noticed that, but it's also got this sort of mineral touch to it. So overall, quite a quite complex little white wine uh, with many different flavours and, and quite a lot of nice structure to it. Uh, quite good weight. Uh, when it comes to food matching, I think it's quite versatile. You can, you can match it with many different things. Uh, seafood is definitely a good choice and a, and a sort of good seafood salad. Uh, but because of that extra weight, it can actually support dishes, uh, slightly richer dishes. So think of it like, you know, I know, grilled chicken with sort of lemon sauce, that sort of thing, that would be really, really quite nice. Um, vegetables, grilled vegetables, that would be really quite good, I would. Uh, again, you know, this is, this is a deal, sea wine from a good winery, that mm. means they, they actually, you know, have 
lower yields than most of the vineyards and, uh, and you get a little bit more weight and a little bit more flavour to it. Um, I think personally it's quite delicious. I really like it. Uh, mm -hmm. I like it. I feel it's, 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 just, it's quite weighty but I feel it's not got the length that you'd really expect mm. it sort of dies there in a really nice way so it doesn't linger yeah. too long yeah. you know it doesn't have stays well yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. yeah no it's supposed to be crisp fresh and mineral mm -hmm. and uh you know to be dry fresh and young as well um, good stuff i can and certainly drink it on, on its own as i did <laughs> <laughs> well, i can totally drink it as an aperitif absolutely yeah. um good uh, if we don't have any more questions about this wine can we move on to the second one and with good wines now, uh, the second white wine from the same winery. Uh, so this is your Pinot Grigio, Pinot Grigio if you like. Um, however, this is again a DOC wine, which, um, so going back a step, this is a Della, Della Venezia DOC, and this is the designation that was introduced relatively recently in 2017. And this was essentially done to distinguish and elevate the producers um, of better Pinot Grigio within the region. Uh, so they just wanted to give them a little bit of a, of a recognition for, for doing a good job. Um, Pinot Grigio, or Pinot Gris, uh, this is what it looks like. So it's actually not a white grape variety, you um, probably know that. Uh, it's a mutation of Pinot Noir, so it's just a sort of a lightly coloured red, red grape variety, if you like. And uh, if you press it gently and you don't keep it on the skin contact, uh, it would end up with a white wine. Um, the thing about Pinot Gris as a grape variety, it's a French grape variety, it tends to lose acidity if you if you don't if you if you're not careful. Um, so to give you an idea, if you look at Alsace Pinot Gris from Alsace, for example, it will produce this sort of quite rich, quite full-bodied wine without a lot of freshness. Um, however, what Italians do, they, they pick it a little bit earlier in the season, and what it does, it retains the acidity, and they are able to produce this sort of fresh floral wines with, with a good freshness and, and this sort of crisp character and, and I think that's why you know Italian Pinot Grigio is like a thousand percent more popular than Alsatian Pinot Gris because everybody prefers this sort of you know lighter floral style of the Pinot Gris. Um, let's have a little sniff and a little, little taste. So again this is 2023 uh, stainless steel, no oak, no bottle ash, nothing like that. Um, very fresh, very clean, sort of slight mineral touch to it as well. It's ripe, uh, but def you definitely get this sort of citrus skin, that lemon skin, uh, fruits. And this is what I mentioned at the very beginning. So they do pick it early in the season and that gives you that sort of lovely citrusy freshness of the palate. It's very light, uh, very, very clean, very precise, uh, sort of very, very crisp on the finish, but with this sort of lovely citrusy aftertaste, which, which I quite like. Um, so again, completely different to the sort of Alsatian style of, of Pinot Gris. Uh, when it comes to food matching, uh, again, I'll be quite happy to drink it on its own. I think it's quite a good aperitif. Um, however, because of that sort of lemony flavour and that lemony acidity, it goes really, really quite well with a lemon pasta. I don't know if you've ever had it, it's, it's one of the simplest dishes ever, and it's just delicious. It's literally just pasta and garlic, and loads of parmesan cheese and lemon drink, and it's, it's delicious. It's really, really good. Um, do we have any questions about this wine? Don't be shy. <laughs> As you can tell from the slight peppiness, mm. but it is that next level up, it's not just you know, Pinot Grigio, uh, for the mass market, this has very much got the depth and complexity to it. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that sort of extra layer of complexity comes from lower yields, and uh, I think this is one of the requirements um, from DOC, you need to, you need to restrict your, your yields, and uh, yeah, it gives you an extra sort of layer of, of flavour and complexity, absolutely. When you say, you know, you've got the, the step below, I, IGT, IGT. What are the main differences that then would take something from an IGT up to the next level? There is there's quite a lot actually. Mm -hmm. So with IGT, there are very little rules when it comes to what grape variety you can use, okay. what um, you know, what yields you can you can make, um, what you have to do with your wine, what ABV you have to do. When you when you get to the DOC level, 
they will only give you a list of permitted grape varieties that you can grow and use. Okay. They will tell you that you can only have a certain amount of yields per hectare, i.e. you can only harvest so many grapes per hectare of vines. Uh, they will tell you that each of the bottles of wine has to have a minimal alcohol level. So you have to have good ripe grapes to, to make that wine. Yeah. Um, for DOC there is also a, a tasting panel. Okay. So there's, you know, once you produce your wine they will taste the wine and just make sure that this actually reflects the, the region as it should. Uh, so that there are many, many different criteria that they have to sort of hit to get that DOC on the label. And it gets even harder for DOCG. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the guaranteed at the end of, of DOC. This is the highest level of wine in Italy and they have even stricter, stricter rules and control panels and, and the rest of it. Uh, but yeah, so generally speaking, the, 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 there's quite a lot that they have to take off the list to, to get that DOC. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, moving on, if we don't have any more questions. No? Okay. Good stuff. Now, the next winery, so this is the Cadirajo, Cadirajo, sorry, we're not in Spain. Um, and um, I, we picked a Chardonnay, so um, it's always quite risky because I know the, the sort of uh, general perception of Chardonnay is, 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 is not as it used to be. Um, however, this is very different. Um, so Chardonnay is, is, is this sort of very humble, quick variety, which I think is great, because it really reflects the terroir. So it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a good way of, of translating where you grow your wines and you know, what you want to make with your wine to the bottle. And, and for this reason, so I really quite like and appreciate Chardonnay. Um, it's, it's got a bit of a, a, of a bad reputation because of the, the sort of Chardonnays from the 90s and, and 80s where they you know, put them in oak for too long and there was no fruit left and, and it was just not a very pleasant uh, drink. Um, however, the modern Chardonnay, especially like this one, uh, it's all about the fruit. So with Chardonnay, the, the cooler the climate, the more sort of green fruit profile you have. If you go warmer, it gets more sort of stony fruit. And then even if you go even warmer than that, it sort of gives you the tropical fruit flavors. So it really translates the climate and the temperature to the, to the bottom. Um, if you smell this one, I mean, this is right sort of in the middle, heading towards this tropical fruit. So you definitely got this sort of lovely, lovely sweet peaches, but it sort of hints towards this sort of pineapple and, and slight tropical fruit already. So somewhere in, in between the tropical and the stone fruit uh, flavor, which I really quite like. Uh, also honey, I, I do get this sort of honeyed, honeyed flavor to it. This sort of lovely, lovely sweetness. Uh, and th th that's got nothing to do with oak. Uh, they, they did use, um, they, 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 they sat it on the leaves for other words, uh, but that's about it. Well, you can only taste it on the palate. Um, the thing about the Cadi Rayo is they use quite a unique uh, growing system, or, or trellising system, if you like. Same uh, called the uh, Belmsfera system, invented in the 1800s. In, I think it was actually invented or invented it. Uh, quite unusual for many different reasons. Uh, they invented it to reduce the amount of mildew they get. So essentially they elevated the wines uh, to, I think it's like 2.4 meters or something like this. And what it does, it increases the ventilation in the vineyard. And the more ventilation you have, the less diseases, diseases you have and the less sprays you have to use and so on. And also they expose the grapes to more sunlight. Uh, so they get a sort of slightly riper, riper fruit. Uh, anyhow, going back to the wine, uh, lovely sort of sweet, inviting, inviting uh, aroma. Definitely stone fruit. Definitely sort of tropical fruit on the palate. Look, it's it's, it's fresh. It it actually starts quite quite full bodied, but it finishes a lot a lot fresher and crisper. Um, it's all about the fruits. There is no oak whatsoever. They use uh, they use lease aging, so they kept it for uh, I think it was over a month or so on the lease after fermentation, just to increase that sort of creaminess and the body and the fuel. Um, however, it's definitely a fresh and crisp wine, mm -hmm. and, and I'm really hoping that our customers are going to like it. Um, when it comes to food matching, I mean Chardonnay is a perfect uh, wine to, to go with a variety of different foods. Um, think of the texture and and the, the sort of tropical fruits. 
so in my mind, I mean, any sort of chicken with, with sort of sweet sauce, like, you know, a, a peach based sauce or something like that, or like um, a barbecue chicken. I don't know if you've ever had it, but a barbecue chicken with a pineapple and a cranberry sauce. It's delicious. <laughs> it's really good. And with a wine like this, it would be absolutely, absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Um, also, richer fish. So, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking even richer than that, you know, something with, with like, an, like an oily fish. So mackerel, salmon, or tuna perhaps, something like that, that would be, that would be quite good. Um, overall, I think, you know, a very well balanced, uh, with lots of different flavours. Uh, good, crisp finish, and uh, yeah, quite decent. What do you think? I like this one. I, I do like the more tropical sort of flavoured mm. ones, rather than the, which is my personal taste, the right. sort of crisper, um, rather than the sort of floral ones. Right. Um, and I think this really sort of hits the spot. And, Yes, a lot of nice foods there that you can have. <laughs> um, I even still go with a ham and pineapple pizza, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so. It's okay. a moment, it's taking me to peach snaps. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a moment. Yes. Yeah. No, it's definitely got this sort of ripe, ripe stone fruit, that sort of ripe peaches. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I was very Good memory, pleased yeah. with it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the park. It's really interesting, yeah. so I can never guess that was a Chardonnay. That just was nice. That's, yeah. There you go, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, yeah. yeah. Like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the reviews. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, from I, I, I tried to sneak in a Chardonnay a couple of times, so it never worked, really. <laughs> <laughs> Did this Chardonnay grow in that, with the, the, like, the old school Bella syrup? Was it growing? That Correct, way? yeah. 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 So, if when we did the Mark Henry Ruzzo boxes, we talked about the winds coming up the Adriatic, mm -hmm. then it tells you where they went out of sea to go. <laughs> so, what you find is that it, you've got a lot of mist and a lot of, again, lots of humidity. Of so, absolutely. So, it's where it's, it's obviously it hits the Alps and has to go up. Yeah. So, all yeah. the water gets left behind. So, that's why they've got those big, I mean, it looks like a mangrove forest. Yeah, yeah, I mean, to get an attempt to spread all the air out if you've got absolutely. I mean, it, it, it literally looks like a pine <laughs> forest, you know. And if you look at it from the top, it's I think it just looks spectacular. Oh, it's it's got nice. this sort of fantastic, um, yeah, good stuff. Uh, right, so a Sauvignon Blanc, and this is from Marca Trevignano IGT. So, this is the, the sort of area, um, north from Treviso. Uh, so this is your Prosecco land, if you, if you like. Um, so now if you look at the differences between two different grape varieties, you have this sort of humble Chardonnay that reflects the terroir and, you know, and the climate. And then this is the other side of the spectrum. So this is 100% Sauvignon Blanc that sort of shouts uh, a little bit. You know, it, it, you can straight away tell this is a Sauvignon Blanc just by smelling it. Um, because it's got this very distinctive um, herbaceousness. So you can... You know, you can you can address it as uh, I know, a tomato leaf or a, or a black currant leaf, but it's, it's always there. So, you know, the, the fruit profile will change. So, you know, the cooler the climate, the sort of more green fruits you get from from Sauvignon, the warmer it gets, the more tropical it gets. But that herbaceousness is, is always there. Um, some people like it. Um, some people hate it. <laughs> um, I I think it's really quite interesting. Again, and, and here we are on this sort of tropical spectrum, so, so think of this sort of tropical guava, like a fresh guava fruit, um, mixed with this sort of tomato leaf um, smell, and, and, and here you go, that's, that's what it smells like. Very, very distinctive. I mean, you know, if, if you had this in a blind tasting, you'd be smiling because one sniff and you can write down this a Sauvignon Blanc and you just take it, take it off and move on. Smells uh, like my, my uh, granddad's greenhouse. Yeah. Oh, way, you know, when you walk that's in a greenhouse. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's that tomato plant yeah, you know, yeah. sort of thing that I'm getting from it. Yeah, it's yeah, hundred percent that very, very persistent uh, herbaceousness. Look, the palate is delicious. I think you get, you get this, um, again, that sort of lovely sweet tropical fruit complemented by that herbaceousness and I, I get like hints of mint as well for some reason mm -hmm. that it's got that sort of minty uh, aftertaste which is I find quite quite interesting and, and, and quite delicious. Um, yeah. As for food, um, I'd be quite happy just to drink it on its own, I think it's you know delicious enough um, but Sauvignon matches quite well with all this sort of strange foods so artichokes, asparagus, goat cheese 
uh, these sort of things. Um, so if you're having a sort of salad with all different stuff in it, uh, a bottle of that would do really, really quite nice. Um, do we have questions about this particular way? Do we like that? I'm not asking you. Like. <laughs> <laughs> do it taste like lockets? Mm. <laughs> 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 I love a locket. <laughs> 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 love a locket. That's what it reminds me of. Right, moving on. So the last wine from this winery is actually Reds. So this is 100% Merlot. Uh, Merlot, again, this, uh, this is a French grape variety uh, grown in the sort of uh, central of Veneto. Uh, Merlot, as we probably know, is responsible for some of the most uh, prestigious wines in the world. Think, you know, Right Bank of Bordeaux, uh, Pomerol and so on. This is Merlot. Um, however, it's um, spread around the world. And this is probably the second most planted grape variety, if I'm not mistaken, after the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so quite a popular grape variety and the reason for it being so popular it produces a very sort of approachable wines uh, with lots of um, this sort of moorish red fruits if you grow it in, in a slightly warmer climate like central Veneto and yeah that's the case in here so we have this sort of lovely ripe blackberry with, with the sort of plums again very sort of ripe and, and lush plums and also you get a hint of like coffee and, and the sort of slightly spicy character to it um, however, the, the sort of party piece for Merlot is, is the part. So it produces this sort of uh, very round, soft, mellow wines. Um, they are tannic, however, tannins are quite soft and mellow, so it, it, it doesn't really give you that sort of drying sensation on your, on your gums. Uh, let's have a taste. Yeah, it's definitely you can definitely tell that you know that the tannins are there, but mm. that it's not quite as intrusive as some of the some of the big Spanish Absolutely, ones. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, it just it feels it lingers quite nicely. Yeah. Merlot is you know it's, it's almost famous for producing this sort of round and yeah. soft and plump wines, um, and you know this one is spot on medium body. It's um, very soft, very mellow, easy to drink. Uh, Serve it slightly chilled with a variety of different foods, and mm. this is the sort of bottle of wine that you can drink with pretty much anything. Uh, you know, from pizza to burgers, um, it, would, it would work very, very well with, with all sorts of different things. Uh, nothing too complicated, again, this is a 100% stainless steel, no oak, nothing like that. It's just 2023 Merlot from a relatively warm, uh, warm region uh, of North Italy. Okay, do we like that? Mm, I really like that. Good stuff. Any, any questions on the Merlot? Fantastic. Right, if we don't have any more questions, we can move on. Um, now, so the last wine that we have is actually a DOC Cambellara, Cambellara Classico. And um, we know Suave, right? So Suave is the sort of, um, again, a, a very underappreciated wine because of the past and, and because of what happened in the 80s and, and how they sort of exploited the area and so on. Uh, but, but, Gambellara is, um, is, when you look at the map, it's literally on the other side, uh, northern side of, of the region, uh, to Suave. And, um, and, um, and the interesting fact is that Gambellara actually was um, uh, recognised as a DOC region two years before Suave was. Um, however, Gambellara never had the same sort of um, you know, popularity as Suave because they have quite a, it's a quite a limited region, it's, it's quite a small region and they only have vineyards on slopes, so they can't really produce quantity, uh, unlike Suave. So what happened in Suave was that, you know, that the wineries sort of took advantage of, of the better wines from Suave and they planted vines on, on, on flat land and they produced lots of sort of water in Suave and like flooded the market. With Gambellara they couldn't do it because they simply don't have, don't have the vineyards to, to do so. Um, so anytime you get a bottle of Gambellara, think of it as a sort of a, a superior suave or a good quality suave, if you like. Um, I told you this is very different Veneto than, than you can get. <laughs> um, the thing about Gambellara is that no one really imports it in the UK or anywhere else because you know it's quite difficult to sell. Everybody recognizes suave, no one, nobody knows what Gambellara is. Uh, it's the same grape variety, grown pretty much in the same area on the sort of lovely volcanic soils. Um, and let's have a little taste and smell. 
so I mean, this this is a, a, a sort of a textbook um, Gargonega, the grape variety used in, in this wine. So quite rich. You've got this mm -hmm. sort of spicy saffron, mm -hmm. uh, yellow plum, baked apple, lots of different things, uh, but very very particular um, and very different to anything else. Definitely gives you a nice kick. That one. Mm -hmm. It's it's got a spicy yeah. texture, yeah. yeah. Uh, so bear in mind this is classico as well. So mm -hmm. it's not only Gambellara that you'll see, it's actually classico. Okay. So this refers to the original zone of Gambellara that was initially recognized as for you know for production of better wines. So this is like the Gambellara that you want to try if you like. Now, you know, this is this is quite a full bodied white wine. Um it's, it's it's got again this sort of baked apple on, on the palate with spiciness that definitely, definitely translates here. Initially quite rich, but then the acidity is good and that minerality, the minerality kicks in as well. Um, definitely a food wine, so any, for me at least, any pork di dishes, so like you know, a pork and apple casserole or, or like, you know, even like a good sort of sausages with apples, it will be, it'll be absolutely delicious. Uh, also think of um, like um, like you know pasta with, with like saffron sauce that sort of thing that would be really really quite nice uh, definitely a food wine definitely interesting and something different I like to think what do we think really different mm -hmm. really different compared to, to the other ones and um, I really got compared to the rest and really got the minerality in that one. yeah you yeah. can really tell there's something there and you yeah. talk the volcanic soil mm -hmm. um, and that's that really stands out on that one perfect really fantastic yeah, no, this is this is definitely uh, one of the hidden gems, if you like. <laughs> I think this is my favourite of the bunch, absolutely. It's fantastic. Yeah, it just has a different taste to everything else, but it's not by any means something that I wouldn't want. I mm. definitely want more and more of that. The the baked comes through in a way that you don't see it in any of the other wines, where yeah. there's that depth there that I mm. can't really put my finger on, but it definitely is fantastic. Fantastic. Good. Smashing. Right, okay, something quite special. Um, so, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Veneto is uh, famous for uh, Prosecco. Um, however, there is something called uh, Lassini Durello di Osi, uh, which is quite an obscure little sub-region just north of Verona, uh, that produces the wine, sparkling wine, the same methods, using the same method as Prosecco, so the Charmat methods, um, but using a um, great variety called Durella. Uh, once they fermented, they call it Durella Law for some reason, but the grape variety is actually called Durella. Um, it's, it's again a very sort of unknown indigenous Italian grape variety. Uh, they have something like three and a half thousand of indigenous grape varieties, so it's impossible to know all of them. Um, but this is quite a find for me at least. Uh, it's, it's one of the little gems that you don't really see anywhere in the UK or well, pretty much anywhere in the, outside of outside of uh, Verona. Um, so yeah, the region itself, north of Verona, very close to Alps. So we're looking at quite a, a steep vineyards, quite cool climate. Um, you should be getting quite a lot of minerality in this wine as well. Um, on the nose, fresh, sort of citrus, floral, quite delicate, quite subtle but very, very sort of pleasing mm. and inviting aroma. Mm. Palette, again, you get this sort of lovely citrus and green, green apple on the palette um, with this lovely sort of floral hints and that minerality as well. Uh, the bubbles are very fine. The, mm. you know, the face is super fine, super smooth. Uh, this is because they use the extended Charmat method, so they actually keep it under pressure for quite a long time and you know the longer you keep it the, the finer the bubbles are. Uh, the same goes for champagne, you know, the, the older the champagne the bottle the, the, the finer the bubbles. Uh, so this is the same sort of principle. Uh, but overall the wine is I think very well balanced. Uh, it's got a lovely freshness to it. Uh, there is about 10 grams of residual sugar um, which um, you can't really taste because of the acidity. So Durella as a grape variety is, is sort of famous for being quite acidic. Hence, it's, it produces, or it's you know, good for producing sparkling wines because you need that acidity, you need that freshness in the sparkling wine. Um, as for food matching, um, I think this is a very good aperitif, uh, but I'll be quite happy just to have it with you know, a board of different things, all sorts of charcuteries, um, cheeses, and that sort of thing, just, you know, just to nibble on and have a glass of that along that. Uh, I think it would be absolutely, absolutely delicious. Um, 
What do we think? Do we like that? I like that. Um, yeah, it's. Um, you say the bubbles are very fine. Do you mm. feel like they would, similar to other sort of wines? They would last a lot longer mm. than some of the sort of other sort of prosecco's. When yeah. you know, when it just goes flat quite as quick, it seems mm. to last a long time longer than this. Again, bear in mind that that was open a good couple of hours yeah. ago, and uh, mm. you know, so if you if you open it fresh, you'll be you know there, there'll be a lot more bubbles in it than there'll mm-hmm. be a lot of uh, sort of persistent. Um, and this is always a you know a sign of a good quality sparkling wine if you if you have the the first last thing in the bottle after opening. Um, okay, good stuff. Any questions from this side? No, no, good. Good to go. Smashing. Uh, yeah, a very very good find and quite unusual if you like. Um, now, right, so let's move on to the reds. So we starting from the very light and moving on to quite full body reds. Um, right, so the first red, this is from Progetti Agricoli, and this is another DOC wine uh, from Bardolino. Bardolino is essentially the same region as Custozza. Custozza is the white equivalent or the other way around. Custozza is the white equivalent of, of Bardolino. Um, essentially, this is. Um, the same grave as your Valpolicella, but grown around the Lake Garda. Um, so you're looking at the Corvina um, and Rondinella, predominantly, so the two indigenous um, grape varieties from Veneto. And this is a, a, a light, refreshing, fresh, crisp red wine that you should drink chilled um, pretty much on its own, or you can match it with several different dishes, but let's get to this later. Um, yeah, serve it slightly chilled. And um, it's all about this sort of fresh sour cherry. So, very briefly speaking, you have the Corvina that gives you this sort of sour cherry fruit and Rondinella and good acidity, and Rondinella gives you that sort of herbal, herbal notes to it as well. Um, so, so, really, really quite interesting. Again, super light, super fresh, very juicy. It's got that sort of lovely juicy structure from Corvina. Um, very easy to drink. Uh, I would be quite happy to drink it on its own. But you know, these sort of wines, I mean, again, you can you can drink it with all sorts of things, like, you know, a, a sort of fairly light tomato-based mm-hmm. pasta, uh, pizza, burgers, this sort of thing. I would go very, very well. But I, I had it with swordfish. Mm-hmm. Don't laugh. <laughs> it was absolutely delicious. And, you know, someone told me, someone told me that once that, uh, he was actually a Valpolicella, that you know, these wines they match very well with fish, like Gretchen fish, and I was like, mm, you know, it's not going to work. And then I've tried it and it's, it's fantastic, it's mm. really, really quite delicious. Um, so, so yeah, a very versatile, easy to drink in red white wine uh, that you should drink chilled, and I think it's really quite well made. Mm. Um, any thoughts? Do we like that? Really easy drinking. Mm. Yeah. Really easy drinking. I, I felt, you know, it was the, the tannins weren't, you know, mm. That's sorry, I've used the word a couple of times, intrusive, um, but I, I felt it just went in really well and I could easily drink that as well. Brilliant, yeah. yeah. It's like mm-hmm. a summer red wine. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It's nice yeah. and warm outside, yeah. yeah. you don't want a white. Yeah. So, yeah, it's with, with the Italian mills, they're much more drawn out. Mm-hmm. In, it's very easy in this country to think of it, you have the wine with the course, it's all very rigid and regimented. It flows a lot more having wine that's mm-hmm. much more open and approachable. Yeah. then got the length of time that yeah. you perhaps don't take it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Bardolino actually. Mm-hmm. Oh, I quite like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, good stuff. Um, if we don't have any more questions, let's uh, move on to the next one. So with this one, we're looking at this sort of um, central Veneto. Uh, it is 100% Cabernet Franc, which is uh, relatively unusual for the region, I would say. Uh, it's 2019, so we should. So all of the other wines we've tasted, apart from the sparkling, uh, were the sort of 2023 fresh vintages. This is a little bit older. This is this one's got a little bit aged to it, and uh, and you can definitely, definitely, definitely taste that and smell it. So I mean, on the nose, it's quite typical for Cabernet Franc. So you, you get this. Um, I mean, I call it a dusty cherry. So you get this sort of leafy sour cherry smell to it. Which is very quite distinctive um, for Cabernet Franc, um, uh, but on top of that, because of the age, we do get this sort of slightly dried fruit quality as well. This is quite typical for the wines that are, you know, not matured, matured, but developed, if you like. So 2019, so we're looking at what five years in the bottle now. 
Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely spot on to drink right now. Still a nose. I'm almost getting that um, tomato smell. From yeah. The way. yeah. Cabernet Franc is actually part of the Sauvignon Blanc. So you know the Sauvignon Blanc is the very herbaceous, mm -hmm. great variety that we tasted. So Sauvignon Blanc is an offspring of Cabernet Franc. Hence that herbaceousness, the sort of dusty cherry and the, the, the herbaceousness you get from Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, this is, this is pretty much the same thing. It's the same chemical compound found in both grape varieties. Um, palette, spot on medium moderate. Uh, you yeah. definitely get this sort of cherry, cherry fruit, fruit coming through. Uh, again, it's, it's a textbook Cabernet Franc. Uh, with, with a little bit of any, with a little bit of age, uh, tannins. Uh, you know, by now they're just soft and mellow, and delicious, and you can just quite happily drink it on its own. Um, when it comes to food matching, um, you know, you do get that sort of certain sweetness in the wine. Hence, it would go very well with the back because you know it's not too heavy. It's got tannins, but they kind of soft and mellow, and that sweetness always complements the back. And also, you know, because that dried fruit. It will go quite well with all the sort of mushroom based dishes, so mushroom ravioli, that sort of thing, that would be really, really quite nice. Yeah. And then, you know, for, for the sort of um, quicker options, pate, you know, yeah. a good French or Italian pate. It yeah. <laughs> would be really quite good. Um, yeah, definitely, a duck's definitely a great show. It, if you, it's like duck, it goes well with duck, like a plum sauce. Though, mm. you know, that's sort of, yeah. that's Generally like, speaking, you know. that goes well with sweeter stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think this one's got this sort of, sort of lovely ripe sweet fruit to it. Um, it's, don't, don't mistake it with sugar, it's sweet fruit. There's yeah. no sugar in one. Um, good stuff. Do we have any questions on the cup of the front? No? Mm -hmm. Um, good, right. Uh, the next one is quite interesting. So this is from Salvaterra uh, Winery. Uh, they are located in the heart of the Valpolicella region. So we're looking at the sort of east from uh, Lake Garda, if you like. And, um, and they did something different with this wine. So, so this is called Riposato. Um, and, and it's... Um, do you know how Amarone is made? So essentially Amarone is made from uh, this, apart, you know, they use a passimento method, which means essentially they dry grapes on strong mats and so on and so on, and they lose the water and concentrate the flavors, and they do it, I think the minimum for Amarone is 60 days. So they would have to dry the, the grapes on the mat for 60 days. Um, and then they, the, after making Amarone, they would take the grapes and they would put it in the Valpolicella wine, hence the Valpolicella ripasso, because they dry pass the, the grapes through Valpolicella. Now, with, with these guys, what they, what they did, so they, they use the same grape varieties as for Amarone, so you have the Rondinella and Corvina and so on. Um, however, they only dried the grapes for, I think it was 15 days or something like that. So this is like a baby Amarone, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, so you should be getting the same sort of qualities, but it's not going to be as concentrated and as heavy. Um, with the idea being that, you know, Amarone wines, delicious as they are, they're quite challenging, you know, it's a, it's a 15, 16 yeah. percent um, alcohol wine, it's, you know, it's quite tannic, it's concentrated, it's heavy, it's almost, it's almost a, a, a liquor, if you like. Um, so the idea behind this wine is to have some of the qualities of Amarone, so you're looking at the same grape varieties uh, with the same methods, however, you know, it's, it's, it's not as intense as Amarone would be. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's got a delicious nose of the sort of, again, cherry. Cherry is a, you know, a, a signature of Corvina, so you always get cherry flavours in, in most of the wines from Veneto red wines. Uh, but on, on top of that, yeah, you have this sort of chocolate, smoky, coffee um, notes. Really quite complex. You just want lots of big gun polenta, don't you? Mm. <laughs> really, really quite interesting. Go and try it. Smells like what Italy, like this is what Italy When you try it, it's got, it's got plenty of tannins, but they're quite soft and velvety. Mm -hmm. It's got that sweetness, again, that, that sweetness, that's not sugar, there is like two grams of residue sugar in it, so pretty much none. That sweetness comes from the sort of dried fruit. 
um, you, you get this lovely cherry flavour to it, and there's just layers and layers of complexity, and it lasts for quite a long time, and the acidity is, is really good. So the thing about all this drying process and stuff, so you know the, the, the grapes they have good acidity to start with and you just concentrate the flavours so you end up with this lovely mixture of fruit concentration and lovely freshness on the palate. Um, when it comes to food pairing, I'd be quite happy to drink it on its own to be honest. Um, I but but it, it, it does go well with all this sort of slow cooked stuff. So the, the, the Italian they have the vivo shanks. Um, slowly cooked with like vegetables and stuff and something like that with this, this would be absolutely, absolutely delicious. Um, a good, good barbecue wine as well. Mm. So you know that sweetness and that full body with you know the smokiness from the barbecue. That would be I mean I agree, however I wouldn't want to share it. Yeah, you don't share <laughs> it. No. So I probably wouldn't take it to a barbecue. Yeah, no. yeah. I mean you know, you take it to the barbecue and drink it on the sun in the corner. Um, good. Uh, no, I, I just thought, you know, w when I tasted it, I just thought it was, it was so interesting and, you know, it's, it's such a good idea to actually get this sort of, you know, the, the, the qualities of Amarone without the heaviness and, and, and I think it works very well. So uh, it's really, like, accessible, like, so everyone can drink this? Well, the thing about Amarone, it's like, you know, they really quite challenging, they can be quite challenging. Uh, you know, especially when you're sort of new to the wine and you open a bottle of Marone, I mean, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's full on. <laughs> it's good, but it's full on. It is sort of the counterintuitive thing on the quality levels though, because this is technically an IGT. Correct, yeah. Because you'd never get it past the DOC or Correct. the DOCG legislation. So yeah. whilst that yeah. is a good way of getting a good typical wine of what you want, mm -hmm. if you see a good producer, they'll use an IGT to play Correct. around and get something more interesting into the market or more forward thinking. Than yeah. Otherwise, they just say no, which is probably yeah, a longer yeah. topic than we have here. But so you don't get too caught up with IGT versus DSC. Yeah, essentially, IGT allows them to do more things. Mm. Um, so as you know, as James mentioned, that if you have a good producer and he wants to do something different, i.e., this without calling it Valpolicella, um, yeah, IGT is the, the way forward. Well, this is this is what it looks like. So that's that's how they dry the grapes. Um, so the the picture in the corner, so in the left, I, I think this is after twenty days, if I'm not thirty days. That that's thirty days, because that's for the next wine that we we have. Uh, but essentially, what, that's what they do. So they, they have this. It used to be in the sort of open sheds on top of the hill, mm. but now it's a lot more modern, and they have this temperature control building where they when they ventilate the grapes and they slowly dry without getting rotten. Um, so. The next one up, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's from Arcola, it's, it's another DOC if you like, and, uh, and this is just um, east from Verona. It's, it's a little bit flatter, it's a little bit warmer, uh, hence they, they grow uh, mostly international grape varieties. And uh, it is under DOC, and the DOC allows them to grow a Merlot and a Cabernet Sauvignon, which is relatively unusual in Italy, let's put it that way. Um, the interesting thing about that is that they use the same methods for these grape varieties as they use for Amarone, so they use the Apacimento method. Okay? And now you have the Nero di Arcole, which is the equivalent of Amarone made with different international grape varieties, and then we have the Passo Nero. So the Passo Nero would be the equivalent of the Valpolicella Ripasso from this particular region, but it's made with different grape varieties. It's Italy, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyhow, so to cut this story short, uh, we have a blend of Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, it's mostly Merlot, with I think 20% of the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon to, to give it that sort of tannic structure. Um, they would make the wine, um, age it I think for four months in a, in a, in a Slovenian uh, or Slovenian barrels. Um, so they would make the wine as normal. And then they would add the, the pomas, the, the grapes from the, the, the Nero di Arcole, the, the Amarone from that region, to that wine and they would repass it for three months to get that extra flavour, extra texture uh, from, from the grape skin. So after the fermentation of the Nero di Arcole, there is always like some sugar and some alcohol <coughs> and flavour left in the skin, hence they reuse the, the skin for this one. I mean, when you when you smell it, it's a it's a lovely sort of Moorish nose with um, 
I mean, cherry truffle. That would be the one, one of the one of the descriptions I would have. You know, this lovely sort of um, chocolatey cherry truffles, uh, with bits of coffee and uh, so liquid. Sorry. Yeah, go on. It's a bit more full-bodied than some of the. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it gets um, heavier as, as we go. Yeah. <laughs> Half of this one, right? <laughs> this, this whole box is like perfect for summer. Mm. You've got like chilled friends, some incredible whites, and then you're getting like the heavier reds, but they're perfect for a barbecue. All you want is like a, a steak, or like something, mm. like, a, something grilled with it. But like, you know, every single bottle of wine from Burnett about tasted is, even though they're quite a full body, they have this lovely freshness because mm. of the acidity. Um, so, you know, because of the climate, it's not too hot over there, you know. They always have this lovely freshness and the acidity, and um, and yeah, they're, you know, despite being quite full body, they you know they not just fat and heavy. They, mm -hmm. They're actually quite refreshing. Uh, I mean, this is delicious in my humble opinion. <laughs> it's, it's, it's complex, it's rich. You've got yeah. this chocolatey coffee flavours to it, um, but at the same time, you know, the, the, the finish is just fresh and crisp and delicious, and you can you can drink. But it's quite really well balanced. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It balances yeah. it really well. There's nothing that's too overpowering. Yeah. It's, it's really, yeah. Um, touch of sweetness to it, yeah. um, but again, that sweetness comes from the dried fruit, not from the actual sugar. Um, food wines, I mean, again, you know, I, I like to sort of drink this sort of wines on drum because, you know, I like to appreciate these wines. Um, but yeah, you can match it with all sorts of like, full on dishes. Um, so when it comes to food pairing, I always think about you know the, the weight and, and, and the texture of the wine and then the weight and the texture of the food. Um, and sort of grilled meats in here, that would be, be really quite a nice uh, lamb, which springs to mind, you know, mm -hmm. lamb likes that like, sort of touch of sweetness and the, and the heavy full body style. Um, what do we think? Do you like that? Yeah, yeah. They're definitely a little lamb that I could do though, so it mm. keeps the, it's there to complement more, yeah. to be the main feature. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Good stuff, yeah. Uh, no, I feel, again, this is, you know, uh, it, it sort of ticks all the boxes for being a, a wine 52 wine mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it, it is off the beaten track, but it's equally delicious. Um, so good, good okay, stuff. Said, well, what did you see the, the, the Merlot to Cabernet sort of? It's, it's 80 Merlot and 20 Caber oh. Cabernet Sauvignon, or give or take. Yeah. Um, so Cabernet Sauvignon is there to add this tannins and mm -hmm. structure to the wine. Um, but yes, yeah, so, uh, I think it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty yeah. healthy. Yeah, you can tell it's more on the Merlot side. You know, I get a lot of that, but yeah, lovely. Good stuff, good stuff. Right, if we don't have any more questions, uh, <coughs> we'll probably move on to the last one. Uh, again, as you mentioned, this is the IGT, so this, this sort of allows the producer to, to do something a little bit different. Um, in this case, yeah, they blended uh, Corvina Rondinella with Cabernet Sauvignon, um, and this is quite an interesting wine. I mean, in here we have, you know, super low yields. Um, they, they, they sort of use the best of the best to, to produce the, this, this wine. Um, it's absolutely delicious. Uh, when, you, when you smell it, I mean, coffee beans, mm -hmm. like that straight away. I mean, it's, it's there and it's quite, quite distinctive. But it's also got this, um, the, it always actually translates to iris, you know, the, the, the purple flower. And, uh, and it's definitely got this sort of uh, flowery notes to it, despite, you know, the, the coffee and the black cherry and the chocolate. Really quite interesting, really more sure and dark and, and full on. So, with these guys, they, they do everything by hand. So, they hand harvest the grapes, they, you know, they, they, they select only the best bunches to go into the vat and the press. Um, and um, they age it for, I can't remember how many, how many months it is, but I believe it's six months in the French oak barrels, just to, just to polish it off and round it up. Mm. Lovely. Um, look, proper full on wine, but again, it's, it's what I just talked about before. You get this sort of lovely freshness at the end that you know, it makes the wine um, very drinkable, very approachable. It's not just fat and heavy, it's, it's, it's actually quite delicious. Um, flavour wise, I mean, you know, anything from the sort of black, black cherry, uh, coffee, hence chocolates, quite, quite a complex little wine uh, with lots of character and, and a very good texture. 
um, fruit matching. I mean, again, drink it on its own. I'd be very happy to drink that on its own. Uh, but yeah, match it with a good cheese board. And, you know, just enjoy it. Enjoy the cheese and the wine. Uh, this is quite, quite a delicious bottle of wine. Yeah, I'm going to drink quite a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. What do you think, Mike? No, that's, I mean, like that is, you've got to be sort of the real earthiness, mm. the gaminess, and so yeah. you've got porcini mushrooms, mm. and all that, all that deep richness, and that'd be fantastic. So, yeah. Okay, that's our yeah. last wine. Mm. Everyone, listen, thanks very much for coming along. Um, I hope you enjoyed the wines as much as I did. And um, yeah, I, I hope to do uh, a, a similarly good job with the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.